Hello everyone, good afternoon. This is Jessica Saldana. Uh, I'm very sorry I cannot participate live uh, in class tonight. I'm having some transportation difficulties between Houston and San Antonio, but uh, nonetheless, I will use what I have and hope that this presentation works this way. Uh, so for tonight, I wanted to talk about the interior castle by Saint Teresa of Avila. I will be using the format that we've been using thus far uh, on how to approach um, classical texts. So uh, without further ado, here's my presentation. So a little background on our author. Uh, Saint Teresa of Avila was clearly born in Avila, Spain. Uh, she was born in March 28th of 1515 and died in October 4th, 1515. 82. She was uh, one of ten children. Uh, it is said that she was the most beloved of them all. Uh, she, she apparently had a personality that was very extroverted and she had an, a very uh, easy time adapting to all sorts of people and circumstances. At the age of 15, she actually uh, lost her mother. Soon after in her adulthood, um, she went through a very particular physical journey. Uh, she experienced severe health issues. Um, in November 2nd uh, of 1535, she actually entered the Carmelite Monastery of the Incarnation at Avila. But it was actually very shortly after uh, that she became seriously ill and failed to respond to any medical treatment. And it is said that she fell into a coma. It was so profound that it was thought that she was dead. Uh, after four days, she actually revived. And... Um, she, acu uh, she attributed her her healing to Saint Joseph, um, and it was at that time that she entered a period of mediocrity in her spiritual life. But she did not, uh, at any time, uh, give up praying. And actually, during that stage, which is said to have lasted 18 years, she experienced a series of transitory uh, mystical experiences. We know St. Teresa to be a reformer and a writer um, and uh, uh, even a doctor of the church. She was actually canonized in 1622 by Pope Gregory the 15th and um, she received this honor actually um, together with St. Ignatius of Loyola, St. Francis Xavier and St. Philip Neri among others. And later on in uh, 1970 uh, the church gave her the title um, she had long held in the popular mind, which was a uh, doctor of the church. And it was actually uh, her and St. Catherine of Siena who were the first women to be honored uh, with such um, a title. All right, so the intended audience for this particular work. Uh, we should actually start off by... Um, speaking on the fact that Saint Teresa spent most of her life in a covenant. It is said that she was never formally trained in academics and um, was quite repulsed by the idea of attaining any sort of uh, public fame or popularity and so on. And um, in fact, she was very much opposed to writing um, what uh, her superiors uh, had intended to be a, a guide of sorts for spiritual development uh, through prayer, service, and meditation for the younger sisters in her community. Uh, she did, nonetheless, she did uh, write the work that we'll be talking about today out of obedience at the request of her uh, superiors. She considered herself and therefore her her writings to be of so little importance that she did not ever reread what she had written in between writing, se writing sessions, as it is said. Uh, her audience were then uh, the sisters of the covenant. But we can also say that she also wrote for those who might someday have the desire to penetrate either the, the outer or the inner uh, mansions, which we'll, we'll talk about. In just a second. Um, she wrote um, the the interior castle towards the end of her life and it is said that she started the book in June 2nd of uh, 1577 and finished it around November 29th of that same year. Um, so while we touch on 
uh, next will be uh, what was happening, you know, in the background, the social and historical context behind this particular work. Okay, so we have to remember that this was all taking place in the 16th century, which uh, has been known as Spain's golden age. We can say that Teresa certainly lived in an age of exploration as well as political, social, and religious, religious upheaval. It was precisely during the 16th century that we see a time of turmoil and deep, deep reform. Um, we know based on her birth date that she was born before the Protestant Reformation and died almost 20 years after the closing of the Council of Trent. So we can think of um, uh, God gifting Teresa in and through um, the, the mark that she lives in the church and the world in, in a threefold manner. First of all, she was a woman. Uh, second of all, she was a contemplative. And third of all, she was an active reformer. Uh, as a woman, Teresa stood on her own two feet. And even in the men's world of her time, she was her, we can say, quote unquote, her own woman. She entered the Carmelites despite strong opposition from her family, particularly uh, her father. Uh, we see that she's a person who's wrapped uh, not so much in silence as in mystery. Uh, she was a woman of, of God, a woman of prayer, of ongoing conversion, yet uh, she struggled on and much of that you know, had to do with what was happening contextually. Uh, she was a woman of others. She was uh, one to, through contemplation, spend much of her time and energy into uh, you know, a vision of, of reformation for herself and for the Carmelites as a whole. Uh, to lead them back to the full observance of the primitive rule. Hence, she founded over half a dozen new monasteries, you know, with uh, papal permission. Uh, she traveled, she wrote, she fought, um, always to renew, always to reform. Um, and in herself, in her prayer, in her life, in her efforts to reform, um, in all people she touched, she was a woman for others, a woman who inspired, and uh, a woman who um, who gave life in a time of uh, so much transition and so much turmoil. Okay, so let's uh, do a quick overview of the mansions and some of the uh, language that she'll be using throughout this particular work. St. Teresa begins her book about the soul's progress in prayer and in virtue uh, by lamenting how little effort many people make to care for their, for their souls. Uh, she says that, quote, faith tells us that we possess souls, end quote, um, that are made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, we should take time to consider the soul's great dignity and, and beauty and to carefully preserve for that very beauty. She uses this metaphor of a castle um, that is envisions the soul as if it were, quote, a castle made of a single diamond uh, in which there are seven mansions, each mansion containing many rooms. Uh, the, the outer walls of this castle constitute the human body. The outside of the castle um, is challenged by many venomous creatures who represent the uh, temptation of, of sin, which the soul is now trying to over, overcome. And that outside of, of the castle um, is said to often be paralyzed by sin. Uh, Teresa has this very central concept um, to her spirituality, which is um, the realization that God is uh, very much uh, present within the soul. That is, he dwells within the innermost mansion of the human soul. Thus, um, if we use Teresa's image of the castle, he would dwell in the seventh mansion. She says, quote, all harm comes to us from failing to realize that God is near. And uh, she quotes scripture here, you know, for the kingdom of heaven is within you from the gospel of Luke. Um, we see that um, the soul's 
mission is to journey within these mansions to unite itself to God so as to plant itself like like a tree in the quote living waters of of light of life um the soul's enemy she states again and again it's a mortal sin uh you know she says uh no thicker darkness clouds the soul than than morton's mortal sin it produces nothing but misery and, and filth bringing quote endless and eternal evils in its train uh, she explains that the journey here begins with forgiveness. We need to beg God to deliver us from such evil and to redeem ourselves in the blood of Christ. Uh, she explains that we enter the castle uh, through prayer, that we need to escape the, quote, snakes or other poisonous creatures that live outside the castle, and uh, we need to be redeemed by God's boundless mercy, and thus the soul can enter the castle through prayer she says quote souls without prayer are like people whose bodies and limbs are paralyzed okay so we have the first mansion entering the first mansion through the practice of prayer um here we see that the soul needs to spend time in the rooms of quote uh, self-knowledge and uh, humility it is in these rooms that the soul spends time meditating on its own uh, need for God, for God's goodness, and turns from thinking about itself to setting its eyes upon Christ, upon uh, the greatest good, lest the devil should uh, deceive the soul and um, make the soul prefer sin over God. Uh, Teresa sternly warns her sisters to whom she's writing, um, that you know without humility all will be lost she calls them to defend uh, their souls from the attractions of worldly pleasures and worldly ambition as well as the deceptions of the devil uh, saint teresa also advises the soul to make the lord's blessed mother the soul's intercessor and also uh, his saints okay so the second mansion uh, the souls that enter into this stage are purging themselves from imperfection and growing in charity. Uh, it is in this particular mansion that the soul is growing in holiness through perseverance in prayer, conversations with uh, good company, um, and uh, edifying content, you know, surrounding yourself with, uh, with some edifying resources. The soul uh, is to spend uh, time and uh, more solitude, more silence, and um, it's to also move farther into the castle as it, you know, cleanses and and refreshes itself and grows in charity. Um, it is said that it is um, the soul needs to experience greater desire for God, and what comes with that is. Uh, the chance for the devil to begin waging a fierce war against the soul, reminding the soul of the pleasures and honor that it used to experience formerly outside the castle. And consequently, the soul is to persevere, and so it is vital that they flee evil companionship and be willing to embrace suffering. In the third mansion, we notice that the soul is still governed by reason. And so St. Teresa tells us that as the soul enters this third mansion, um, despite it having overcome some initial difficulties, um, it, is, it is crucial that the soul uh, seeks to not offend God and avoids committing even venial sins and rather spends hours in recollection and prayer and in practice of uh, works of charity and is uh, you know very careful in making good use of their uh, lives and even possessions the souls here are, are said to experience consolation and spiritual sweetness in prayer and meditation it is said that they are living quote upright and carefully ordered uh, lives uh, St. Teresa says that they need to learn that, quote, perfection consists not simply in consolations, but in the increase of love, end quote. So these souls have not yet made a, 
uh, full surrender of their wills to God. And so to increase the resoluteness of the soul's will, God may allow it to experience long, long periods of, of spiritual dryness, if you will. And St. Teresa says that her nuns uh, ought not to panic if this happens, because God um, knows well and knows better, um, you know, with how to help us grow, put us through some fire, test us. So such a test has the effect of making the soul conscious of its misery and to gain a quote, uh, clearer perception of its shortcomings and so to realize that it is still has a strong attraction to earthly things. I mean, this experience, she says, that help, uh, helps the soul gain a quote, a great deal of humility, meaning uh, to learn to value uh, perseverance and even suffering, and it helps prepare the soul for the life of mystical prayer, which will come in the fourth mansion. So it is in this fourth mansion that we see the soul experience great earthly detachment and interior freedom. It is here also that the uh, the, the mark is, is is seen. This advancement is noticed. Um, in the soul's journey to a greater and more profound intimacy with God. And even St. Teresa states that, quote, uh, the soul is now getting nearer to the place where the king dwells within, end quote. Um, the fourth mansion, we could say, uh, marks the transition from the purgative and active stage of the journey to the illuminative and passive stage. So in short, it is in this mansion that the soul is beginning to enter into supernatural prayer as, as God, as the king, takes more direct action to communicate himself to the soul. It is in this mansion also that St. Teresa explains the difference between active and passive recollection. Uh, the soul in the first three mansions was primarily involved in prayer that constituted active uh, recollection, meaning it was involved in in that effort in prayer, such as choosing the time and the place and, and consciously closing your eyes in order to turn inwardly toward God. Um, and here the soul may experience sweetness and consolation during this prayer, but but said consolations are more, um, more uh, natural satisfactions than God's supernatural activity. That is, our reminds us that the interior world of God is always close at hand and that if we continue to persevere in the practice of prayer, in, in overcoming obstacles, trials, and, and fear, uh, we'll see a greater love of the King arising in the soul as it prepares it for the gift of supernatural prayer. In the fifth mansion, we see that the soul comes into a fuller union with God, this is a much more defined communion with the divine. Entering the fifth mansion, the soul is still in the illuminative stage of the journey. So there are still, uh, you can say, quote unquote, hidden treasures in the castle for the soul to discover. Here, St. Teresa wonders how she will ever be able to explain the, uh, what she calls the, the riches, the delights found in the fifth mansion. Uh, she also tells us that Many of her nuns make it to the lofty state of prayer found in this particular mansion. Uh, the soul will now go even deeper in prayer to unite herself to God in what is uh, appropriately called the prayer of union. And uh, we see some scholars call this prayer the prayer of uh, incipient union or the prayer of the sleep of faculties. Uh, here the soul is said to, quote, fall asleep to the things of the world. And in this sort of um, death or sleep, uh, the soul becomes much more united to God. Thus, the faculties are suspended and there is virtually an unconsciousness as the soul appears to have withdrawn from uh, the body. The hallmark experience of this prayer is the certainty that However short in duration, 
the soul was united uh, to God. In the sixth mansion, we see the soul falling deeply, deeply in love with God, with with the King. It is here that uh, we see a transition from the illuminative stage of the journey to the unitive stage. Uh, the soul again has fallen deeply into a sacred and loving union with the transcendent and is now ready for spiritual betrothal to him. Um, so the journey through the sixth mansion will not be without danger and affliction. And so to persevere, the soul will have to suffer much. Uh, St. Teresa laments and even says, quote, Oh my God, how great are these trials which the soul will suffer both within and without before it enters the seventh mansion, end quote. And, and still, the, the suffering to be experienced by the soul in the sixth mansion uh, will be thankfully counterbalanced by many mystical experiences that the soul undergoes, which are of truly amazing nature. It is in this sixth mansion that the soul begins to experience extraordinary mystical phenomena that one associates with some great saints like Padre Pio and St. John Bosco. These experiences of God, which St. Teresa is recounting from personal experience, include um, visions, raptures, ecstasies, uh, tearful desire to be taken out of this earthly exile, um, flights of the spirit, and jubilations, just to name a few. So here we have the seventh mansion, the very last stage in this particular journey. Here the soul has penetrated the very center of itself. Um, St. Teresa refers to this experience as the quote, second heaven. Uh, this is where the soul comes and enters into spiritual marriage with her bridegroom, the king, our, our God, the transcendent. The soul again has penetrated to the very center of itself and and it is brought into this mansion by means of an intellectual vision where uh, the most holy trinity reveals itself in all three persons um here all three persons communicate themselves to the soul and speak to the soul as she uh, says in her text saint teresa is you know no doubt recounting here what she experienced when she entered the seventh mansion she indicates that in addition to this experience, she also was granted a vision of, of Jesus, a vision of, of, of the Christ in great splendor, in great beauty, in great majesty, after having received a Holy Communion. It was at that moment that it is said that Jesus spoke to her and um, revealed the wonderful effects produced in a soul as a result of spiritual marriage. And uh, some of these include, uh, quote, a self-forgetfulness which is so complete that it really seems as though the soul no longer exists so entirely is she employed seeking the honor of god um also she says that um there is this um detachment from everything and experiences and uh, of interior trials um are counterbalanced by the tender love that the Lord offers, wanting to always give, um, you know, of himself to the beloved. And uh, the soul experiences almost constant tranquility, and uh, the soul has no lack of crosses, but they do not unsettle the soul's peace. Um, St. Teresa also says that the soul loses its fear and acquires great strength to serve the Lord and the church. The soul, she says, the soul is ready to bear any cross for the love of the bridegroom. Uh, the soul experiences the almost constant presence of uh, the bridegroom in this stage. So based on this uh, overview of the mansions of the uh, seven stages and that overarching imagery of the marital union between um, love and the beloved, um, I would say that the main takeaways for today's reader, for today's audience is, I mean, first of all, just the type of 
woman of God that Saint Teresa was, a woman of prayer, of discipline, of compassion. I mean, her heart clearly belonged to God. Her ongoing conversion was an arduous, lifelong struggle, which involved uh, ongoing purification and, and suffering. She, you know, upon reading a little bit more on her life, she was misunderstood. She was misjudged and opposed in her efforts at reform. Yet she struggled on courageous and faithful she struggled with her own mediocrity her illness her opposition and in the midst of all this she clung to god in life and in prayer i mean her writings on on prayer and contemplation are drawn clearly from that very experience it's, and it's powerful and it's practical and it's graceful she was a woman of prayer she was a woman of god and again, she was a woman for others uh, through a contemplative. She spent much of her time and energy seeking to reform herself and the Carmelites uh, to lead them back into, again, that full observance of the primitive rule. Uh, she traveled, she wrote, she fought, always to renew, always to reform. I mean, in herself, in her prayer life, in her um, you know, exterior life, in her efforts to uh, to live in true communion with with the divine and with all people she, that she touched she was a woman for others a woman who inspired and gave life like i said earlier um her writings i think have um helped generations of believers um she speaks i think even to our time of turmoil uh a time of ongoing reform i would say and time of liberation for for many peoples um, modern women i would add having teresa a challenging example i mean to be promoters of renewal promoters of prayer um and we all have in teresa and saint teresa a woman to reckon with one whom we can admire and imitate um a fun fact, Saint Teresa of Avila is the patron saint of relief from headaches. I just thought I should throw that in there. Uh, but yes, but uh, to wrap it up, I think um, the first takeaway for today's audience is God is always present. God is always near. He dwells within the soul. Uh, prayer, again, is absolute. It is indispensable and paired with humility and self-knowledge, meaning knowledge of my weaknesses and God's infinite goodness. Um, uh, that ought to be the foundation of my entire prayer life. And when it comes to one's spiritual journey, although sustained by grace, we have to be realistic and recognize that there are many demands of intense effort, which include detachment, mortification, and perseverance, as well as patience, um, as we await, as the soul awaits, for God to um, act on it. And so with that, I will conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you all so, so much for um, joining me virtually in, the, in this way. Again, very sorry I cannot be there live for, for class, but thank you all so much. Have a blessed rest of your Easter season. Have a good evening.